I'm really excited to kind of dive a little bit deeper with our farmer panelists tonight to talk about how these themes can apply to organic regenerative agriculture in Kentucky. So I wanna just kick it off um, by passing it off to our panelists. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and share a little bit about what regenerative agriculture means to them and kind of their inspiration for this type of farming. Um, Brie, would you wanna get us started with that introduction? Sure. Um... My name is Bree Pearsall and I farm uh, with my husband, Ben Abel, and um, a great team here at uh, Rootbound Farm in Crestwood, Kentucky. And um, what regenerative ag means to me, um, the thing that I keep coming back to is that the soil is like our planet's lungs. And I think we're learning more about um, how powerful uh, the soil can be in um, healing so many of the um, degradations that we our modern um, industrial system has created. So um, for me, it comes back to the soil and regenerative also gives us the opportunity to see the farming systems from like a macro view, uh, not just of what's happening on my farm with this animal in front of me, but how that um, practice fits into the bigger, um, to the bigger scheme of things and trying to take that wide angle view and bringing us back to the soil. So those are the two things to me that are most relevant for regenerative ag. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Laura? Well, um, I'm, I'm the grandmother of the group and uh, I've been at this since 1981. Um, I built, I sort of invented with uh, Mel Coleman, uh, no antibiotic, no growth hormone meat, and built a company, had a big horse wreck, sold the company, and retired. And, and I said, I never want to see another cow again as long as I live. Um, but while I was in retirement, I uh, got a Danella Meadows Fellowship in, at MIT, and it was also in Vermont at Cobb Hill. And um, the problem that they were modeling, it was a systems-based course, went on for two years. They were modeling climate. And um, every model that they ran, every run was collapse. And it was, she wrote the book called Limits to Growth, and which was a very famous book in the 70s. And um, so, you know, that is what raised my awareness of the climate crisis. I mean, I'd gone into it thinking the biggest problem was basically chemical farming. And I, uh, I was wrong. I mean, that's related to it. But, but climate crisis is a big one for all of us. I mean, it's happening right now. And the thing about the models, though, that I found out later was that they did not model the ability of the soils to trap carbon. And um, so kind of by through NRCS and through uh, sitting on some policy committees of a, something called the Organic Farmers Association, which Rodale started. Um, I got to talk to all the Rodale scientists and realized that we were farming a great carbon sink if we farm correctly. Um, and, uh, but you know, farming as it is right now is a net carbon emitter by a long shot. So it brings a drastic change to the way we farm. And, you know, Wes Jackson has been talking about this for a long time, but not so much about carbon trap sequestration. Um, so anyway, so through Rodale, I learned about uh, the ability to sequester carbon. And they've just come out with a book, which I'm going to read a little bit out, uh, from here, called uh, Regenerative Agriculture culture and the soil carbon solution. I mean, they're saying we can sequester all emissions uh, if we farm right, but it takes a global farming system change, which is good, not gonna happen real easy. Um, when I built the beef company, however, um, I realized that farming differently, farming better, and then sort of attaching to the industrial food system for distribution was a disaster. And um, uh, and so with my carbon sink farming here, and I've been fiddling around with this for, I've been doing the rotational grazing for decades and I've been doing the cover crops for a decade now. Um, 
Uh, and I can't really get the tillage reduced, so we're working on that. Um, but attaching to the industrial food system is a disaster. And so I realized that we had to localize the food system. And so, you know, figuring this it was my last project, uh, I'm 63. Um, I decided that we would uh, build a local farm to table distillery and restaurant and a, a hemp company, a large mercantile that's basically regional and distribution brick and mortar and the rest of it mail order. And um, so I went into our downtown, bought a couple of buildings and started all this. Opened the restaurant, boom, we had COVID. So that's been pretty bumpy, but it's still alive. Um, but anyway, so that is my basic inspiration is Danella Meadows Fellowship and, you know, figuring out what to do. Absolutely. Like you said, Lori, you've been at this for a long time. There's lots of, lots of work to be done. Um, Jessica, what about you? I'm Jessica Hodges. I own a modern heritage farm with my husband in Glendale, Kentucky. Um, I think regenerative agriculture starts with a deep respect for nature. And then we focus on how we can partner with nature in food production in a way that allows us to give back more than we take, more than we're taking from the soil so that we're constantly building the soil. So the next, the next farmers, the next generation that, that farms this land um, will have a leg up. You know, they, they get to inherit good, healthy soil to grow nutrient dense food on. And um, that's a large part of our inspiration is being able to produce food, healthy food that we feel good about feeding people and serving our customers. And then um, I think just the feedback of our customers is inspirational to us as well. You know, the when they tell us um, how they crave our food, um, how they can tell that there is a difference in the taste of our food. Um, and then. Earlier than that, a, a bigger source of inspiration was, um, I think when I was a sophomore in high school, I purchased my first Wendell Berry book, which was um, the culture of, uh, of the unsettling of America, culture and agriculture. And um, I've been obsessed with Wendell Berry ever since. Um, and, you know, I think, I think he kind of makes a lot of sense about um, the problems in our food system and how regenerative agriculture um, is just better for human health, better for the environmental health. Um, and, you know, when we pay attention to all the symbiotic relationships in nature and in our food systems and in how we produce food and in, in our gut and how our, how our bodies process food, um, I just think regenerative agriculture makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. And, I already see uh, um, a few questions coming in through the chat. So thank you for that. If there's other thoughts that you um, folks are have kind of other comments or suggestions, put those in there as well. And um, to kind of get us started with our first question, this was one that was submitted um, by an attendee of the event. And I'm going to have Laura um, answer it just to kind of explain the difference between what certified organic is and what regenerative or organic is to kind of lay the foundation for this conversation. Um. Well, you know, again, there is, there's industrial organic and, um, you know, it's, I don't know if it's likely that you all have seen it, um, but um, the first thing that is true of industrial organic is that uh, there's no livestock integrated with the cropping systems. Uh, you know, they're just hauling in fertilizer, they're using stuff, they're, they're using basically kelp, seaweed, fish guts, hauling in manure, hauling in compost, and rather than having it bound together. And that is the first big difference. Um, again, I've, I've talked about industrial, uh, not only in, in um, the California Valley, but in, it's, it's coming from South America, it's coming from Australia, it's coming from Central America. Um, the second big difference is, uh, and so regenerative by definition can't be industrial and imported. Um, it just make, doesn't make no sense if you're trying to squash carbon. The second one is tillage, and this is a hard one. If you're trying to farm organically without tillage, you know, Juan's here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, Ben's here to tell you, you got a problem. 
um, we have we have rigged up what we call the invention. We're trying to mow the Johnson grass on top of the beans. Um, we're trying to flame weed weeds in the corn. Um, you know, we tried a, something called a hemp hawk, which didn't work around the hemp. Um, but figuring out how not to disturb the soil and be organic is difficult to scale. I mean, you can only hope so much. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot more innovations with regenerative. For example, things we're starting to try uh, is tree cropping, um, using all kinds of species. You're really trying to get as much biodiversity as possible. Um, we're going to plant trees and try to intercrop them on a little piece of land, not, not big, just see if we can do it. Um, and um, it's just, it's harder. I mean, organic's hard enough, this is way harder. No, I, I think you said it, you said it well, Laura. <laughs> um, and we appreciate that. So it, just kind of laying the foundation, it's that all those are certified organic practices plus soil health plus biodiversity um, is where regenerative ag is. Um, and Jessica, I want to uh, pitch the next question to you. I want to, I know you're in the process of transitioning certified organic and working with an oak transition trainer, but also deeply pa passionate about regenerative ag practices and want to ask like what one aha moment you had on your farm journey of transitioning and regenerative ag. Okay, I, I couldn't really decide on one here. So, so there's <laughs> two that are kind of at the top there. Um, first of all, just the smell of healthy soil and what leaves can do for the soil. Like, you know, we incorporate a lot of leaves and, and I mean, that's what happens in nature and we try to mimic nature on our farm. And, um, and when we started doing that, just the way that the, the smell of the soil changed was like the best thing in the world, the best smell ever. Um, and then another thing um, that really stood out, and we've been we've been growing organic since we started. We just haven't been certified. We just finally um, decided to go through the process because um, as our farms increasing and our customers are increasing, we feel like um, having that certification would be really beneficial for our farm. And um, we three years ago moved to a new farm, um, and we decided when we moved to this farm that we were not going to use any sprays, um, organic, even organic approved sprays. Um, in the first couple of years, we knew we would have some crop loss because of this. First couple of years, we planted far more than, you know, we were knew we would need um, to try to compensate for this. Uh, and we did have some loss this year. For the first time though, we have seen the population of beneficial insects explode on our farm without introducing any um, praying mantises, the ladybugs, um, the bees, uh, a lot more birds, just seeing the diversity of, um, of life uh, on the farm, like the longer we're there and the more we commit to observing nature, um, observing the life cycle of the pests and the wildlife and the beneficial insects that are there and, and the relationship that they have and how they work together. Um, and, you know, that's another source of inspiration too, just, just seeing all these uh, natural systems and how they work together and and knowing that there's in one lifetime you know you're not going to know all there is to know about regenerative farming and I think that just the fact that there's such a wealth of uh, information out there to learn and to pay attention to um, is pretty inspirational too. Yeah absolutely and we have a question that just came through the chat that I was hoping you could do a quick follow-up Jessica just um, how might home gardeners apply some of the regenerative processes you're talking about? Is there like maybe one or two things that you feel like folks could, could do in terms of um, applying those on a smaller scale? Sure, I think um, insect netting definitely works on a smaller scale um, if you don't wanna use sprays and you're trying to protect certain crops from insects. Um, and I think just uh, paying attention, like we've really started to pay attention to the life cycle of the pests that we we're having trouble with, and then um, scheduling our planting, our transplantings, and our seedings where it didn't coincide with the influx of these pests. Um, and then, like depending on how small it is, you know, there's just a lot of stuff you can do by hand, um, like hand picking and, and crop rotation for sure, so that um, you're not you're not building up d pests and disease problems for yourself. And then. Uh, study beneficial insects and the habitat that they need and make sure that you have 
you know, what those beneficial insects need to thrive so that you're attracting them. So that you have the, um, the food that they need, that you have water, you know, a water source on your farm that, you know, you can bring those insects in and um, work with nature just, but pay attention. That's the main thing. Pay attention to all of it and, um, and use it. No, I think that's great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I see other questions in the chat and we will definitely get to those. Um, before we answer um, any of those chat questions, I just wanna, um, there was another question that came in through the um, registration and I want to uh, pitch that to Bree and just ask her a little bit. Um, we had an attendee just acknowledge the fact that a lot of these regenerative agriculture practices that we're talking about have been co-opted from black and indigenous communities of color and um, not given a lot of credit. So I'm just hoping you could speak to that and how we can support diverse farming communities. Yeah, so I, uh, I first heard the term regenerative probably two years ago. And now I feel like it's one of the most popular buzzwords in sustainable farming. And, and I think with the popularization of the term regenerative, um, has come some, some pushback that is, that is very valid that um, a lot of the practices that are now held up as the, um, you know, the, the regenerative practices are practices that are derived from uh, generations and centuries of indigenous land management and also land management by other um, indigenous people, black people, farmers of color. Um, but yet we don't often see those faces as the, um, as the face of the regenerative movement. And so there, in the film, they did make some um, acknowledgements of some of the um, indigenous roots of the practices. Um, but I think as is often mirrored in our dominant culture, uh, folks need a, often a white male voice to kind of bring forth those practices for them to be seen as valid or practical. So I think that's some of what we're seeing with the regenerative ag community is, is who gets to be the experts. Um, I think some of the things that we can do to, to push back on that are to name it and to call in um, when those practices have, you know, deep roots in, in other cultures that are, that are being borrowed from, but then also looking to, um, in this case, the indigenous farmers who are still championing these practices um, the farmers of today, the indigenous farmers of today. So it's not just recognizing um, indigenous farmers of the past, but those today as well. So I think that wherever we're getting our farming, um, our farming news, our, our clickbait, you know, if you're like me, I'm on Instagram all the time, um, seeing what's what's new, make sure that we're following and we're centering the voices of um, black, indigenous and people of color farmers as well. So some of the folks that kind of first opened my mind to some of these holes in the regenerative model were farms like Sylvanaqua Farms, which I'll drop in the chat. Um, I know Oak was gonna have a, a um, keynote speaker from Soul Fire, Soul Fire Farm. Uh, we'll put that in the chat. Um, black soil here in Kentucky is uh, lifting up the voices of black farmers in Kentucky. So I do think it's important that we are making sure that we're um, learning from, from the experts from their own voices and their own experience as well, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And we'll try to share like additional resources in the chat and just to kind of um, hold that space or let it you know, just acknowledge. Um, and so there's some other questions coming through the chat. And one was um, going back to you, Laura, and about tillage um, and just about um, minimizing tillage. Can you speak to some of the innovations in organic no-till? Sure. Um, uh, the big innovation in uh, organics is a roller crimper. And um, after much, uh, what am I going to call it, uh, consternation, uh, Rodale told us where to get one and manufactured for our tractor. And so, which we did, uh, unfortunately got here too late because of COVID. Um, and so we did get to use it this year, but we're planting, in fact, we've already, already started planting cover crop rye, so uh, thick enough, so the roller tiller will work. The whole idea is that you get the rye when it's shedding pollen and you kind of crush it with this thing. And um, so it's a big, a big mulch, but it doesn't come back up. 
Uh, it's not alive. It's just big mulch. Okay. All right. Here, here's the picture. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, and uh, so anyway, we'll be doing this next June. And you know, again, we we've got. I saw somebody put up something about Instagram. Well, the market deal has Instagram. I can't even run Facebook very well. I do it. Uh, but look at look at our Facebook thing, and uh, we'll be saying well, we're going to try the troll of Cripper and invite everybody out who wants to do it. And we're looking for people who have done it. And I saw Scott Franklin was on there. He's got a farmer that Juan and I are going to go see down it toward on the Tennessee border uh, to talk about that. But that's the big thing that we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and there was a follow up just about. Um, let me see. I'm going to scroll through a little bit. There was another question that I wanted to get to um, from the chat, which was just talking about um, how we keep ecologically produced food from being eco expensive boutique products that are out of reach of average households. Um, and was just wondering if there was anyone that wanted to speak to that just in terms of um, and wanting to raise the bar of food, but also not um, decrease access. Yeah, I can, I can try to speak to that. Um, so I think that a lot of the travesty that we see in modern agriculture is a result of extreme capitalism and it's failing farmers, it's failing our planet and it's failing consumers. And so I think that um, approaches that I wanna see in organic agriculture is I wanna see farms that are um, where it's viable to farm organically. And I wanna see um, a community surrounding that farm that is healthy and where it's viable for folks to afford to buy the food that they, that they want for their families. So I think there is a lot of hope. Um, there are already many models that are pushing the boundaries. Um, and usually they, they center on things like cooperative economics, you know, thinking outside of the mold of just the traditional um, capitalist structure. So like fresh stops, new roots model where folks, folks are pooling their money and able to access all organic uh, local products on a sliding scale um, with, uh, SNAP benefits and WIC benefits. So there are, there are many, um, there are many examples out there. I think we just have to put our attention and resources to them, but I don't think, I don't think we're going to get there by trying to make, just make organics cheaper or something like that. I mean, I think that, um, that is a, is not the solution that we need. We need solutions that lift up ecological practices in the scope of health and also lift up people's livelihoods and wellness as as consumers so that so that we can all work together. Absolutely. I feel like just that triple bottom line of sustainability and just raising like sustainability of um, health and environment as well as um, social systems. Um, and feel free to drop additional questions in the chat. There was, I wanted to spend some time on another question that was submitted um, and just give all the farmers a chance to kind of talk about this a little bit more. And so one of the questions that was submitted um, prior to the, uh, in the registration, was just kind of our vision for organic farming in Kentucky and what might be our 25 year vision, um, which is a long ways out and what we hope for Kentucky and organic regenerative farming and so I want to allow each panelist to kind of talk about that, speak to that a little bit more, as well as maybe share one resource with folks that are tuning in right now of a way that they can get involved or be a part of this movement. Um, and Jessica, I was hoping you would kick it off, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I feel like the way, the best way to propel this movement for people to get involved with this movement is... Um, we need to educate children so that they can be informed consumers when, when they have purchasing power. Um, I feel like nutrition education, especially is something that's missing um, in the public school system. Um, I, think, I think if we can, you know, get kids out on farms, introduce, introduce kids to farmers and adults alike. But I think um, if we really wanted to propel this movement forward, um, helping people learn, especially children, like how food is produced, what questions they should ask about their food, 
um, the impacts of, of how their food is produced and uh, when they buy local food versus, um, you know, something shipped from overseas, uh, the nutritional difference of that food. Um, so I think, I think just educating and, and I think, you know, if we can, if we can focus on, on the education of the general public and of children, especially like in one generation, we could flip the food production system in America on its head. You know, if people were just informed, I know, I know as a, like, I never had this, this is something I found on my own. You know, I never, I was never taught this. I was never taught, you know, how to choose produce at the farmer's market or in a grocery store or, you know, why maybe the cheapest thing isn't the best uh, nutritionally. Um, so yeah, I think, I think education so that people can make informed decisions when they purchase food. Absolutely. Do you have any, um, I guess, re a resource or something that you feel like people could go to just to kind of get, learn a little bit more, or maybe even a, a book that inspired you? I mean, I know you mentioned. <laughs> Everything about Wendell Berry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I think, I think Oaks um, Consumer Newsletter is a really good resource, um, especially for people in Kentucky, you know, connecting people and the find a farm directory to connect people. And I think local yeah. farmers, like go to a farmer's market and befriend a farmer, like yeah. start a genuine relationship with a farmer at your local market, visit their farm, uh, get to know them, have them over for dinner. Um, because I think that's the best way to learn. That's the best way to learn about how your food is produced to learn about, you know, the life of a farmer and, and what goes into food production. Um, so I think that's a great resource. No, absolutely. Thank, thank you for that <laughs> plug for Oak. Um, and Laura, would you mind kind of sharing your vision, any tools or resources you want folks to learn about? Sure. Um, well, I took the calculator, figured it out. And in five years, I'll be 88. Um, so I won't be dead, but it's coming fast. Um, not, not one, of, one of the things that I'm really intent on doing is developing a younger uh, generation to farm. Now, Juan is the second oldest person here. He's, he's 50 and or he's in his 50s. Yeah. And, but everybody else is in their 20s or 30s on purpose. And um, so that is my way to keep it on. Again, I've got my daughter, I've got grandkids, but also a really strong team that's in the 30s and 20s. Um, as far as sort of my advice, um, I want to read uh, a, a paragraph or a half paragraph from the road and I think about complexity of the system of regenerative. Um, uh, Researchers studying nine different vegetable systems, some organic, some conventional, over almost 20 years, found that only one of those systems, an organic corn, tomato, cover crop, and manure system, increased soil organic matter along the full soil profile. So, and again, they're, they're looking down very deep because to stabilize the carbon, you have to go, you know, feet down. And, um, so the complexity of these systems is what is going to make it very hard to scale. And, um, you know, but it can't, it can't stop us because it's the only answer there is. And so uh, I'm, my, my vision is don't buy, develop the young group, call out greenwashing. Uh, um, because, you know, I mean, greenwashing, it's not just Madison Avenue now. It's dangerous because it's, making people think one thing is happening when other things happening. And, um, and people that are really trying to solve the climate crisis, for example, by uh, eating meatless hamburgers, don't understand those soybeans came from burning the Amazon. And um, so it's a very complex connection with little transparency. So the only thing you can do is Go local, call it out, and try not to die. That's my answer. Laura, I feel like there's a lot of wisdom in that, in, in that statement. <laughs> um, yeah, and I just feel like just you spoke to the transparency piece and just kind of getting as much information as you can and getting as informed as you can, like Jessica said, and kind of educating. Um, Bree, what's, what's your vision? What's your tools or resources you want to share? 
Um, well, a resource I'd like to share is the film Gather, which if you enjoyed this film, I think you would really enjoy that film. And it is about um, indigenous farmers um, preserving their cultural heritage and foodways. Um, also free online on Vimeo. So the film is called Gather. Um, and my vision, I think, you know, working in working alongside other people, like with an organization like Oak, it helps me to realize I'm not alone and tackling these giant problems um, doesn't feel quite so hopeless when you've got other people to work with. So, um, you know, I think that 25 years from now, um, I hope that we will have found ourselves working in coalition across a lot of other of the social problems that plague our time because I think they're all connected. So how are we working in, in connection with food justice movements to look at food apartheid areas of the city? You know, how are we looking at living wage issues, you know, so that people have the resources to, to participate in a local vibrant um, farming economy. So hopefully in 25 years, we've built a bunch of coalitions and we're working across a lot of social issues. And then I think to kind of drill it down super micro, um, building off of what you know Laura was said, eat, eating locally, just a, a plug for folks to eat, really try to eat seasonally. Um, you know, we run a CSA program and I, I know how hard it is for people to, um, center the, the food on their plate being what is growing in their region at that time, especially for those of us that, you know, grew up with grapes year round, bananas year round, you know, those are the really yummy things that I, uh, that I still buy too. So it's not about shaming each other, but just like, how can we drill back down to what is growing in my region right now seasonally and push ourselves even just a little bit to um, eat seasonally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, like you said, just all about relationship building, building coalitions to kind of strengthen. Um, and I feel like that's a big part of what Oak is trying to do in terms of the future of organic farming in Kentucky. Um, and I just want to share a few other resources that we have. Um, Bree and I think Jessica both mentioned it. We have an online um, find a farm directory. So if you're interested in learning more about Laura, Jessica, or Bree's farms, um, they're listed there. You can um, go to their websites, have their contact information. And I also want to call Ann back um, <laughs> from Edible and um, Slow Food and kind of have her share a resource for you all as well. Yes, thank you. Um, so Edible, I'm excited to say that Edible has has just released its fall issue. Um, and, and this speaks, uh, this issue is very much about uh, the conversation of food equity and access. Um, so organizations like the Louisville Community Grocery, um, that is Cassa Heron and her and many of her colleagues are, are working to, to establish as well as um, the Change Today, Change Tomorrow, Feed the West, Chantrice Martin. Um, we've got a wonderful feature about them. And, um, and as well as the Heinemann Settlement School, um, who's doing great work and Feed Louisville. So the fall issue is uh, a, another collaboration with Edible Indy and Edible Ohio Valley and just very important conversations. And, and of course, great recipes and, um, and a valuable resource for how you can buy locally um, from businesses and, and organizations that are working to build our food economy. Um, I also, I can't let a second go by without thanking Oak and Katie Harvey. Katie, you have done the lion's shares of tonight's event, the organization for tonight. And I just want to thank you. You're, you're amazing. And <laughs> you've worked so hard and, and we're all here um, thanks to your good work. So thank you very much. Um, and some ways to stay in the conversation. Um, just really encourage you all to uh, look at the events that are coming up for Oak and Edible. Um, we've got the farming conference in January, which that you can now sign up for. Uh, in November, uh, Bree mentioned Gather, the movie. Edible's going to host a screening of Gather. Um, so looking forward to that. And Stay tuned for a date on that. Um, and then uh, last year, Edible and Oak partnered for a virtual CSA fair, and we're looking forward to doing that again in the spring. And uh, if, if COVID taught us one thing, it's that uh, CSAs are incredibly, uh, an incredible 
an important way to eat local. And we saw a huge uptick in CSA signups last year and, and uh, are glad people are, are engaging in that conversation. So look forward to details on that. And then um, as you can see the find a farm directory from Oak. And then obviously we'd love for you to visit Edible Kentucky Magazine. And if you didn't sign up um, when you registered for the event and you didn't sign up for the newsletter for either Oak or Slow Food or Edible, we encourage you to do that. And then obviously, you know, following following all of us, <laughs> panelists and organizations alike, uh, feel free to, to follow all of us on social media for details of all these things. So just, uh, and I just too would like to take a minute to thank the, the panelists. You all are amazing women and just really appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anne. It's been wonderful to get to co-host this event with you. And um, I, yeah, I want to thank the farmer panelists. Um, thank you for being members of Oak and also just sharing your farming experiences, your passion, your dedication to this movement. Um, I hope it's inspiring for those that are tuning in. And we want to encourage you to reach out to the folks that are a part of this event. Um, you can contact them. We've got all of their email um, contact info here. So please reach out if you have any other questions. If we didn't get to anything, um, we will make sure to do some follow up in our post event email, send you the recording of this panel discussion as well as some other resources. Um, thank you so much for tuning in with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you at another virtual or in person event in the future. Thank you. And I'm just going to do a little clap. Thank you guys, panelists. Awesome. Appreciate it so much.